name is Nicholas Bell, and I'm the chief film critic with Ion Cinema. And it is my extreme pleasure to be able to speak with Melina Leon today, uh, who is the director of Song Without a Name, uh, her directorial debut, which premiered at Cannes in Director's Fortnight, uh, notably the first uh, Peruvian woman to premiere a, a film in uh, that program. Uh, since then, uh, you premiered at over a hundred uh, film festivals, received a ton of awards. Um, so I, I, I'd imagine that's been quite a ride, especially now that on the other side of it, you're uh, we're in a pandemic, and it's still this is the success of the film is still unfolding, but we're we're all stuck inside. Um, but uh, I was interested to read that. Uh, the production was difficult uh, and years in the making, but I, I wanted to start there because the story has actually been with you a lot longer than that, I feel like. And I want to know how long, how long has Georgina been in your mind, um, considering that based on the film's dedication to your father, you know, this is a story you've been familiar with for quite some time. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for your words. Um... My Georgina has been on my mind for a long time. Uh, I guess um, mainly since I, my father told me about a strange phone call he got from a woman, a French lady that called him uh, from France uh, to say that she wanted to meet him um, to get to know him a bit and say thank you because she was one of the babies that got stolen and she had had her own kids and decided that she needed to, to meet her biological mother and when she went back to Peru, she found out that she had actually been kidnapped. Wow. So, um, so... Uh, I guess since then, and that was a long time ago, I guess 2006, I, I was, or seven, I was still a student at Columbia in New York, um, finishing my master's and looking for a story for my first feature film. So, um, yeah, since then, well, it went, uh, I was still finishing school and I couldn't take the time to write the story as I wanted, I was doing other stuff, and surviving New York, of course. Yeah. Uh, that takes a long time. Um, but then, um, yeah, I guess I started really focusing on the film um, around 2009 or 10, 10 probably. I started to write it with my friend, with my colleague, Michael White, uh, who's from St. Louis, uh, but uh, was studying with me in in Colombia and um, yeah that took a, a long time because uh, we were not focusing on the script really I was it was my project the only personal project I had but um, he was going we were doing other stuff no? um, and then I a company in New York was interested and that didn't work out so I think it was around 2012 that I decided to produce the film myself so I created a company, La Vida Misma Films, uh, in Peru. And, you know, I just created the whole thing and uh, produced it. So I guess, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say how long the film took because uh, it, it was a learning process. And um, just the production, I would say, when we got the government funding in Peru, we, we can say that since we had this first big chunk of money, we... The production took us around five years, but you know, before that, to get to that point, uh, yeah, many years went by. Went by. Yeah. Well, so you've been talking about "Song Without a Name" for a long time. <laughs> yes, yes, and then because of the pandemic, more. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how that's uh, kind of works. Um, at, so as it was coming together, even you know, back in two thousand nine, ten. Um, and the New York kind of deal that didn't go through, uh, was there buzz? Because at that time, there was like Undertow, um, and Claudia Yosa was kind of, uh, uh, I think she had won the Golden Bear uh, around then. W was, did that assist you with that attention kind of on Peruvian cinema then? 
uh, with I think a little bit. Okay. I think a little bit, but when it's your first feature, that that only gets, you know, that somebody gets an award, it only gets you attention, but it doesn't get you a check. <laughs> right. Sure. It's just, right. a, it's just like a positive smile on producers, uh, you know, faces, but that's pretty much it. And speaking of, you know, for a first feature, you directed three shorts before this. Um, yeah, yeah. It, there is, you know, a lot going on in the texture uh, of the film. It, it satisfies on a, a lot of levels uh, besides being um, a historical recuperative uh, item or a, a social issue drama, kind of a thriller, um, uh, the, reflecting on the importance of investigative journalism. Um, and at the end, just, a, you know, a very human story. It's, it's very um, impressive. And so to, to me, the reaction, the response, um, isn't surprising um and how does it feel to be compared to like roma has come up as a lot in comparison to song without a name yeah yeah well it's it's great it's a big honor you know quite on it's, it's a huge filmmaker so um yeah we take it as a huge compliment although we think it's a very different film oh yeah for sure uh, for in sure every possible level that you can yeah. think of. But, yeah, I, to me, I think that's the black and white and um, the uh, plight of uh, the Quechua woman. I, I think people are drawing very superficial comparisons. Um, reading through your influences and in other interviews, uh, Bellatar, uh, I, I think that he definitely comes to mind watching this, uh, just this, this gray, bleak world that's kind of like a nightmare. <clears throat> It, feel, it feels very textured visually. Um, your uh, director of photography was Inti Briones, uh, who's, of course, worked on Too Late to Die Young, The Loneliest Planet. Um, and I read that he also came on as producer, which assisted in the production. Um, and that natural light was kind of used a lot. But as, as we were filming, how was it coming across that this was uh, exactly the texture that you wanted? No, the texture, no, not at all. The, the texture came later. We, we, we discussed it and we worked with Fabinho, a, Brazil, a great Brazilian artist at the end. Um, but um, I guess that the very specific texture that the image has, it's in post-production, but of course the, the feeling came before and we talked with Indy the, about the importance of shooting in the winter, you know, about, I was talking about waiting. We were almost ready to shoot the film towards October in Lima, which is like the uh, spring is starting. And actually it was great that Inti said no. He said, we're not filming this film. It's, the winter is everywhere in your script and he was right to say that um, it's in our memory because he he grew up in Peru in those days too so he said our memory of Peru we've talked about so many times it's winter we, we don't even remember the summer in those days and I had to agree I had to agree it's like I you know I've lived in New York for more than a decade and then when I came back I was like oh actually there is summer in Lima it, it, there's a spring, there's summer, there's, there is fall. <laughs> it's not just what you see in the film, but um, right, that's right. what's an, in our memory. So we waited. We waited till we started filming uh, on June 1st. So we waited uh, like eight months to have oh, that, wow. okay. the, the fog that you see, no? the look that you see. Um, and of course, everything changes, the clothes, everything was going to be uh, for winter. No? Um, and then the, the texture, of course, comes with uh, more uh, reflection about the fact that the photographies uh, that were in the newspapers right. in the 80s were in black and white. And also they, they were very grainy, you know. Yeah, it, it reflects that, that they they these characters feel like images at any time. Those A snapshot of them could have been a, a picture in a newspaper from them. Um, but, I mean, I I love very 
bleak cinema. <laughs> so that satisfied uh, that aesthetic to me uh, for many reasons. Um, Georgina, so uh, she's played by Pamela Mendoza. Uh, I know you've spoken many times about the casting process, but how did you know? Did you know immediately when you uh, saw her? Oh yeah, when I when I saw her picture on Facebook, I was like, I'm telling you, it was like a miracle for me. I mean, I'm not religious at all, um, but yeah, I I thought, well, this to produce this film has been so difficult, and then you don't believe it that all of a sudden you're gonna get this gift that's easy. Um, and that's exactly what happened. I, I went to, well, what I did was I went to the right place. I went to the outskirts of Lima, to Villa El Salvador. I didn't, you know, put an ad in somewhere and say, I'm doing casting in, you know, the commercial areas or, uh, of Lima, you know, the, the more upper class uh, places. And come here, we're doing a casting. No, of course not. Uh, I, I wanted authenticity, I wanted people who could enrich the script and could tell us uh, about their life. You know? um, so I went to this uh, little theater in a shanty town called Villa El Salvador and <clears throat> I spoke to the director of this theater and I told him I'm looking for the protagonist. Of course, I'm looking for the entire, entire cast, but mainly I want to find the protagonist. And I imagine she should be like this, like that. Um, he he listened to me attentively, and he said, "How about her?" And he showed me a Facebook picture. I said, "Wow, she's beautiful. She and she really her eyes are very hopeful. Yeah. Uh, bright eyes." Uh, you know, which is what I wanted. Um, contrast between what happens to her and her actual being that's very joyful. So, yeah, and when she came to the casting, she did an amazing job. She had uh, some uh, training in physical theater. It's not like she was a completely a natural actor. She had before she had some training so we just had to to work on the character and she put a lot of weight as you probably read uh, she's she's very thin no? so she she offered to go to become big <laughs> i said a little bit but she she, she <laughs> yeah, gained a lot um and um, yeah it was just amazing to work with her in every level, she's very political and committed, and you know, she she told me, I think it's great that we're gonna work together. You know, in a way, my my only condition is that we we shouldn't do a, you know, we're we're telling the story of my family in a way, my mother, my aunts, everyone that's before me. So this should be taken. With dignity, you know. Right. I mean, she. There are so many kind of moments featuring her that haunt you uh, after the film ends. You, you know, like I'm still thinking of her lying on that bed, you know, overnight waiting for her child. <laughs> like it's, um, it, it's like a. She draws you in perfectly. Uh, I feel to that performance. Like even on the bus ride when she's in labor, like you're just very much there with her emotionally uh, at every step. Um, going back to uh, your father and the dedication and, and that kind of going on in the background, I really uh, appreciated uh, the characterization for Pedro, uh, played by Tommy Praga, uh, and how you are able to kind of parallel how he's drawn to Georgina and his own kind of secrecy as a gay man in Peru in the late eighties. Um, and I was, uh, I found myself uh, very frustrated with the man that he's trying to have a romance with, <laughs> <laughs> but he felt very much like somebody that's trying to be an actor. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that glass menagerie is, um, evoked as the play he's working on the, um, Isa, uh, he felt very much kind of like the gentleman caller in that play. Who's very self-serving, uh, <laughs> 
was that all? <laughs> I'm assuming that was all on purpose, bringing that in. Well, yeah, well, that's great. That's a great interpretation that he's the the color gentleman color. Um, but yes, uh, I think the spirit of the play was of this need to escape mm. and yeah. this this entrapment. In, uh, that you feel, you know, and also the that it's a memory, you know. He, Tom tells the story uh, from the present to the past, you no? He goes back. So we felt that, it, because we did that, no? we, we are remembering those days, so we, we wanted that feeling, you no? And that's why we picked that that play but yes there is all sorts of interpretations uh, but this is a new one i hear that about <laughs> the gentleman color <laughs> yeah he felt he felt very self-serving he's he's there to kind of get what he needs uh, he, he wants attention per se mm -hmm. you know yeah. he'll, he'll do what he wants until he doesn't get what he wants um but I, I just found that uh, very evocative and interesting and one of many uh, very striking elements uh in the film. Um, so Michael J. White was your co-writer who uh, you mentioned had gone to school with you. Um, at what point did you know, at what point were you done with the script? Well, never, no, okay. never, never, never. When, when we started production, um, I guess I was done with the script with Mike, of course. But when we started to film, no, but then we were, we didn't, we were in a way rewriting the story because um, we realized we only had five weeks to shoot it. So it was too long. What we, we tried to make, to, to fit all the scenes in so we could have everything. But Inti said, I can't do this. It's too much. So we started to cut a little bit and also not only for, because of the budget but because um we we found that we're not we were not trusting images too much and so we, we took out some dialogue there was in the in the scene in the in the bar when they are chatting isa and pedro the the dialogue for example in that scene was longer now we had a he started telling a long story, you know, blah, 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 in his Cuban way. It's very charming, you know. <laughs> yes. He was going to look even more self-serving than, than <laughs> we found him. <laughs> even more, you know. Um, but uh, we said, no, no, it's, it's okay. Let's, because it's more about the Georgina. We're drawing too much attention to this story. It's important. I know it was very important for me to, to tell that little story, you know, but. Uh, we're drawing too much attention. Let's let's make it shorter and more visual with the with the cigarette and stuff like that. The student decisions like this that change the script, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Which you know, in, in that scene, I think still that that works perfectly when he lights a cigarette in response to uh, Pedro trying to you know talk talk about himself, and he's just <laughs> yes, yeah, he's sitting there like a like a little rabbit. Yeah. Um, not so I, I i guess to wrap things up um so it's been a long journey uh and here we are uh with the potential uh to be nominated for a, an academy award uh in the background have you also been working on any other new projects in isolation <laughs> yeah this isolation had some very few points good points but <laughs> one of them was it allowed us to write and me in front of the computer so um instead of going to europe and present the film but, <laughs> but <laughs> hey uh no it's good it's good it gave me time to develop a film that i want to shoot in the andes of lima in the city of cusco okay. and yes yes i'm still of course uh, developing writing and um but it's it's about a teenager and about the realization of her artistic uh, qualities and the proximity of death to and how they relate okay. um, yes but um let's see i still 
I'm cooking a lot. That's mind. okay. It, it's a good time to still be cooking. Uh, but I, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm very much looking forward to what you do next. Um, I, okay. You know, and I, we could kind of begun with talking about, you know, a torturous production process. And I can't imagine that you would have to experience all of those roadblocks per se again, based on uh, the presentation of Song Without a Name, which, you know, certainly uh, it, to walk into this blind without knowing that it's somebody's first film, I, you know, it's just incredibly impressive, uh, has something to say. Uh, again, I think it's uh, recuperative and just uh, empathetic, uh, emotional, and, uh, you know, it, it's not a forgettable film by any means. So um, I, I thank you for uh, your creation and uh, very much look forward to what you continue to do. Thank you so much, Nicolas. It was great to hear talk about the film. Thank, thank you. you. Hey, this is Eric from IonCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.